one of the benefits, I think, of, of a platform like this is that if you are busy clinically or if you can't watch or listen or engage um, real time, you can do this at other times. So that is fabulous for such a time as this. So delighted to be with you all, albeit virtually um, on the screen. Uh, my name is Jacqueline dunkley Bent. I'm the Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England. And good morning to everyone. Welcome indeed to this Scottish Midwifery Online Festival. And good morning and welcome to the Maternity and Midwifery London online festival. Good morning and welcome to the second annual Maternity and Midwifery Festival. What 2020 has shown us is that there's a real need for vigilance, that women's rights are not yet really embedded um, in our maternity system and that they can be easily eroded. My argument is that the solution is health optimization. Prevention is far better than cure. And I think there is a real risk that services that are lost or reduced during the time of COVID are not restored. The hard truth is there is a lot of racism there. It's not enough to be non-racist, swimming in a pool of racism. You have to be anti-racist, actively working against racism. And I say that because when we treat the least, well, everybody benefits. And if I had a take home message, looking at my career and where I've been in my career, my take home message would be grab it every opportunity you can. It's not a rehearsal. Know your limitations because jam too thinly spread is tasteless. Enjoy all and let nobody, nobody steal your sparkle. And I hope that you can take valuable insights from today. And if you're listening tonight or if you're listening next week or next month, take valuable insights from the speakers from today and share the word, share the positive messages with your colleagues. Because in these dark times, in these challenging times, everybody needs a green shoot and a pearl of wisdom. Thank you very much. And um, we are in this together. We stand united together. And welcome to this week's Maternity and Midwifery Hour. Hello, everybody. Um, it's going to be a really interesting and exciting evening this evening. So I'm really delighted that you've been able to come here. And, and well, it's the second episode of the fourth series. And every time I say that, I think I can't believe we're already a year through and on our fourth series. But it's, it's my pleasure to be here as the curator of the Maternity Hour and the Maternity and Midwifery Festival, which we had yesterday, um, and I'm chairing this evening. And I'm delighted to be joined by the two luminaries for crafting and creativity in midwifery. And that is Lindsay Hobbs and Jenny Hall. Here they are on the screen with us. And um, I'll talk a bit more about what they're going to get up to and you're going to soon find out what they're going to get up to but I usually start off with a little moment of the week so I'm going to put Jenny on the spot first to ask you if you'd share your moment of the week. Okay my moment of the week has to be the fact that I was able to see um, three of my daughters who I have not seen for months and my son-in-law Wonderful. one of my son-in-laws and um which was has to be the moment of the week because it, it's just 
gosh, you don't realise how much you miss them, to be honest. And, and to be able to be in the same garden, play space with each other, and just to hang out is just fantastic rather than being on this medium. So that is definitely mine. Fabulous. And that is, I'm sure a lot of people will be kind of experiencing that with you, Jenny. Thank you. That's lovely. How about Lindsay? Can you compete? Mm, I'm not quite sure. But my <laughs> moment of the week was I've recently started wild swimming. So Ooh. I mm. went with a friend yesterday down to our local river um, just as the sun was setting and we put our wetsuits on and we got into the very cold water Ooh. and had a swim <laughs> with the ducks in the stillness and it was bliss. Wow. So is that the first time, Lindsay? No, we've been a few times, oh, um, but this was the first time we've been in sunset. Wow. Well, I'm going to say this is a frightfully trendy thing at the moment to go wild swimming because of they're talking about all the health benefits of getting in that cold water. But I have to say, I don't think I could quite bring myself <laughs> to it, but it sounds lovely. So you've got bliss. some fantastic moments. Thank you so much. Now, I'm just going to do the little introduction that I, I always, almost always do before we move on to a little bit of news. So just as, to, to, as though people will know who tune in but some people may be a wee bit new um, these hours came about about with the pandemic so they're sort of bonus of the pandemic really and um, and the idea was to make sure that midwives midwifery students people who want to become midwives and other people in the maternity services would have an opportunity to get some continuing profession development and some contact with things that were going on elsewhere in midwifery and also to be able to share good practice from other units who are experiencing COVID and being quite actually the, the, the subject of today's creative creativity. And it, people were being very creative, using technology, using different ways of making sure that maternity care was being delivered for, to women and babies and families. And it was a, a really good sharing opportunity. And we've carried on. And we will carry on. Um, and it's been a, a really good um, way of making sure people have accessible information. And I want to say a big thank you to Matflix, who kind of oversee everything and store all the uh, materials after we've done them. And um, so for those of you who are doing um, courses, revalidation, any student midwives, if you need to get any up-to-date information in a very accessible format Matflix is where you need to go it's really good very everything's online and you can access everything um, I don't know if Jenny will mention it later but I know that she she edits and looks after it all so she is the queen of Matflix there for us now we're at the moment we're at the point of opening open air pubs and eateries and we keep, keep still keeping our distance we're still wearing our masks and, and, and being safe, washing our hands. Um, and the, the roadmap is still in place and we're following it steadily. So there are still people catching the um, COVID, sadly. There's still people in hospital and uh, the NHS is still busy looking after those people. So we want to send big thanks and big love to everybody who is is going through that um, and whether they're staff or whether they're patients or family or friends so big hugs to you all and also want to say a big thank you and a big hug as well if I could hug I would to the maternity services because we've carried on providing care to mothers and babies and families and midwives have done that fantastically and that's taken quite a lot of energy to do that so a big thank you to them and I know also I need to say a big thank you to the vaccination services because a lot of midwives are working in the vaccination hubs and it's going so fantastically and, and really giving us a sort of way out to a new normal which is fantastic and of course thank you to all the key workers and their families and I want to say thank you to NHS 
families as well, because they're all living through this and having to support their people. So big thank you to them as well. Now, moving on to this news, the big news, I think the biggest news, apart from the football issue, and I'm not going to go into that because I don't kind of understand it. I'm not a footballer person, uh, but it seemed a bit of a shame to kind of take people out of the system. But I won't go there. <laughs> big news, I think, was the guilty verdict on the policeman who killed George Floyd. And I think everybody breathed a sigh of relief that that was the verdict because when you see the video you can't imagine any other uh, verdict at all and we can hope that that will maybe start some of the healing that needs to go on and maybe change people's views but I, I know it's going to take a long time. On to sort of other things within the UK we've had the new NICE postnatal guidance out uh, um, to well it was this week I think the 24th 21st or 20th that's on your resource sheet so for those of you who want references from this evening that's where you need to go and it's all available on the live stream also there's a, a uniform consultation from the nhs um now that it's not the the nhs sort of supplies uh, people and, and I know a lot of people are very into uniforms, very interested in uniforms. And if you want, how want to have a say, go to the, the um, link on the references list and have your say. I know midwives will have something to say about that. And as you, know, you probably all know, the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation has now announced that it'll be offering pregnant women the COVID vaccine in line with the rollout plan for the UK. So that's a little change. There's also, and we've got elections coming oh, the same week, actually, I believe, as International Day of the Midwife. I believe it's the 6th, 6th of May. And I know that the RCM has published some blueprint patterns blueprints for each of the country's maternity services and the ones I've seen are the Wales and Scotland I'm they might do an England one I'm not sure so that's all on the resources page and I think the biggest thing for most midwives and you might find something this evening that would be useful for this as well is people are preparing for the International Day of the Midwife on the 5th of May so I know there's the virtual IDM conference with some fabulous speakers so look out for that as well um, and in your preparations but I know midwives are very busy with that anyway so I've gone through that and I'm beautifully on time I might say pat on the back for me now this week we're looking at creativity in midwifery and we know that midwives are very creative and we're looking at, at things like crafting and quilting and knitting um, and really exploring that from the, the idea, it's, and I know people in the last year have probably adopted different skills because it can be very useful for stress and it can be very relaxing. People may have had lots of extra time and that might have been a good use of that time. Um, but there are other things that go on when you're doing knitting and, and um, kind of creative things. There is an academic field to this and you, you're going to have this shared with you and you some of you may remember and I have one here the knitted midwives of 2016 which went to the Royal College of Midwives conference and that was in response to a big call by the RCM quite rightly that we were short of midwives and I think someone identified that maybe we should knit some midwives because it was it takes quite a bit I'm sorry, my midwife seems to be losing a hat. Hat's very important for midwives. Uh, the idea was of knitting midwives came up. And I think we've got um, Jenny and Lindsay led that. And that was really to illustrate a very political point. I'm not going to take any of their thunder because I know they're going to talk about this. So I'm really so delighted that we have our two, two special people here this evening. We've got Dr. Jenny Hall. I'm going to do this little intro. She's been creatively educating for nursing and midwifery all of her career in practice, publication and in education. She's also previously the editor for The Practicing Midwife. She's published widely and she's got a wide range of research interests, including spirituality, promoting dignity and respect in education, human rights experience of disabled women, 
as well as the creativity and the reflection within that. She's also a fellow of the Royal College of Midwives and senior fellow, fellow of the Higher Education Academy. And I'm introducing Lindsay at the same time because they're going to have a kind of a chat over tea, I believe. So Lindsay is a lecturer in midwifery. She's a nurse and a midwife. She's a strong philosophy of a women-centred care and practice mainly in the community within continuity of care models and teams and latterly with vulnerable women. She's led products, projects including peer support breastfeeding training, teenage pregnancy, peer support, use of the audit C and antenatal bookings, neighbourhood public health inequalities and caseload midwifery. Her professional interests include um, the culture of midwifery, midwifery regulation, health professional language use, which is, that'd be really interesting. And finally, of course, creative textile techniques. So I will say, Lindsay and Jenny, the screen is now yours and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I've got my, my cup. Have you got your cup there, Lindsay? I've got my <laughs> cup. It has tea in it. It really Fantastic. does. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? Just, just, just because you've just triggered me there, Sue, talking about textiles, is that uniforms are made of textiles and they are a social construction. They're, they're a, the fact that, that we wear uniforms as they give us a, some kind of identity. So just, just kind of made me think about that at that moment. Um, but we will perhaps might even come back to that later on. You never know. But we are literally just going to have a chat, my friend Lindsay. And we do love chatting to each other and having our tea, which we are now doing to do. <laughs> but I'd like to perhaps tell you a little bit more about ourselves, actually. So I'm going to ask you, Lindsay, tell me... Why is creativity important to you? And where does it come from? What, what is your background in crafts in the first place? Well, I'm child number five out of six children. I'm also the first girl. So after four boys, I think my mum was delighted to be able to pass on all her skills and knowledge about all the crafting that she did. Um, she was a very skilled needle woman and she taught me her skills from a very early age. So from as long as I remember, I've been able to knit and I've been able to sew. Um, I hated the classes at school because they just didn't give me that freedom to do the things that my mum taught me to do. And of course, you know, I was always wanting to gallop ahead and they were, no, carry on. You must stick with that waistband until the rest of the class have finished. And I used to find that so frustrating. Um, but it also meant that it made me very self-sufficient. So when I was a teenager and couldn't afford the Laura Ashley fashions that were mm. all over the shops because those dresses were so expensive and you had to go to Chester to Browns to buy them. Um, then McCall's did a Laura Ashley patterns. So yes, got they the pattern, did. we got mm. the fabric and I used to make my own clothes um, and that carried right throughout my career really and when I had children and when you're um, too busy to um, I suppose set aside creativity as something to do you could actually use it for something like making the children's clothes or making things for the children or making Christmas birthday presents or whatever and that theme I suppose has just carried on um, throughout my life and you know as the children left home they each got made a quilt that represented their personality and it was a good way of making friends as well of um, connecting with other people who um, did similar similar crafts so how about you Jenny? Well it's just so interesting to hear your story and apart from the fact that we are from a similar era Let's talk Laura Ashley there. Oh, no. um, is, that, <laughs> is that actually my dear mum was not a crafty person at all. Um, in fact, she, she really did not like it at all. She did not like doing knitting and sewing, though, though as a child, I know that she did embroidery at school and I've got some pieces that she made because it was the expectation 
that you learnt how to do that as a woman, I suppose. And um, But she did not enjoy it. It was not her passion in life at all. My father perhaps was a little bit more arty and he did, did a bit of, bit of art. Um, but I just picked it up as a, as a, a girl. Do you know, I'm also, I've also got brothers. Um, so, you know, I, I am the only girl of brothers and maybe it was a sense of trying to find a different path of identity. Um, but I certainly used to get things at Christmas to make things and I would have made it by the end of Christmas day. You know, I did have just got on with it. Um, I'm pretty good at following instructions, I think. But I also, I taught myself to knit and this was the day, days before the internet. So it would have been out of a book, you know, turning a page and learning that. Um, and I, I taught myself how to do a bit of, a bit of, um, bit of crochet. And my parents would just have this picture of me sitting on the middle of the floor with bits surrounding me. I am not a, I'm not a tidy creative person and I need to have bits around me in order to actually make things um, and then like you I, I did get a little bit of teaching from a friend of my mother's she decided that perhaps it was a good idea who taught me how to make a skirt when I was about eight and went to brownies and guides and did all the badges which I know you did as well um, and then at school like you I did needlework for a bit at school and it was disastrous I did not enjoy it at all because again I felt restricted by by what was being asked of me so I did learn to to make my own clothes yeah Laura Ashley <laughs> in London <laughs> getting cheap material in those days um, it's a lot more expensive these days than it was then mm. back in the 70s 80s time and and yeah I just went on and carried on to create all sorts of things as I have gone on and then ended up using it in my career. So that's my story, I think. And I guess it's actually, how did we meet? Because you, you were well in the North. I mean, you are a Northern person and I'm a, a deep South person. And how, how did we actually get together over this? Well, I think we had a common, we had something in common in that we used to travel to work on the train and yeah. we were both members of Twitter. We were both on Twitter and I think I followed you Probably. and I do remember <laughs> one morning sitting on the train at half past seven in the morning yeah. and seeing a tweet that you had put and your tweet was in response to um, the announcement by the government that more money would be um, put for midwifery technology to reduce the rate of stillbirth. And your response was this, like what? More midwives would be good. So of course, right in my head, I just responded and said, next week in class, UOB Midwifery Society, we will be knitting midwives please bring wool of your choice. I'm going to stop you for a minute because you need to share your screen because I believe you have it available on a PowerPoint. Ooh. I have. I shall put it up. There we go. Okay. Do you want to go back to the original picture as well? Because we did, I just realised that we've been wittering on already and we haven't actually <laughs> even got the first, the first picture. <laughs> well, should we have should we have the first picture? Let's have the first picture because then everybody can see what we look like. This is us. Yeah. Jenny this is, is us. the one with the wild hair. And yeah. I'm the one in the Dennis the Menace rebellious outfit. And in purple, as you note, in purple. And I'm holding my purple computer, in fact, you know, the colour of my phone case. Mm. And I've got a pinards in my in my other hand. So there you are. <laughs> And I think talking about uniform, um, and we'll talk about this a bit more when we look at the knitted midwives, is neither you or I have knitted ourselves in uniform. Absolutely not. We have knitted ourselves <laughs> as we see ourselves. Mm. Okay, so, so that was us on the train. And then somehow I got a little email from somebody through Twitter that said, hmm, 
that sounds like a good idea. And then we were <laughs> off and that was it. That was how Knitted Midwife was born. So we communicated with each other and we got in touch with the RCM. The conference was coming up and um, because the RCM at the time was saying um, about the shortage of midwives, it was there in the news. So we took that opportunity because how many times do we go on shift and it's busy and somebody turns around to you and says, well, somebody just knit me a midwife. Um, <laughs> we've all heard it we've all heard it so somehow um we made that a reality so that was how knitted midwife was born um, at that moment in time the shortage was 2600 midwives but not long after um, we thought of this project it changed and the shortage was 3500 so we set ourselves the task of um, getting 3,500 knitted midwives. Um, we advertised through social media and through contacts that we had through the RCM um, to get as many people as we could to knit the midwives. And then of course, Jenny being Jenny said, mm. well, I said actually, <laughs> well, well actually, do you think we ought to actually research this in some way? Um, what sort of response are we going to get from the delegates? And, and we could actually do a little bit of a questionnaire and find out what people think about what it is that they are making. And Lindsay said, yes, OK. So I then got ethics appro approval for us to do so. And, and the RCM were very kind to, to allow us to actually um, give questionnaires out to the people who were present who, at the conference in order to... Um, to find out some information from them about what their responses are were to seeing the display. And to be quite honest with you, it, it, the responses that we got were pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and we have written it up and we, we are in a place of at the moment trying to find a place to, to get it published because it sort of falls between different stools, but I perhaps won't go into that too much at the moment, but, but it's an interesting exercise in itself, trying to get something like this published. Mm. Um, did you want to say anything more about that? Your experience of actually running the, the, the actual um, event? It was amazing, is really a, a good summary of it. Um, we had a very short time scale because I recall that we started this project around about the May and then um, the conference was in October. So we had a very short time scale for getting these knitted midwives, mm -hmm. but midwives, they listened to the call and they responded. So we ended up with 502 knitted midwives to display at the conference. And if you can imagine the fun we had um, getting them all laid out, like you can see on the screen. But what you will notice is there's a big sort of playpen at the side. And what that represents, that playpen, although it's got midwives, you know, hanging onto the outside and climbing up and jumping out, um, in that um, playpen is wool, and that is the unknitted midwives. So inside that basket, there are 3,000 balls of wool. Um, I managed to get them from a local charity shop near where I live, and um, they were having um, a wool uh, amnesty at the time, and they very, very kindly um, let me have the, the balls of wool. So although we've got 500 and two midwives all displayed there um, in the basket of the unknitted ones and then very proudly on the top is our um, own lovely Leslie Page with her her medallion um, looking very glamorous at the time when she was president at the time she was president she was. of the Royal College of Midwives and she sat she, on the top she was and she, she has her doll I'm sure um, but if you have a look at them all, they're all different. Mm. Like midwives are mm. all different. And going back to this, you know, thing about uniform, then many of these midwives are knitted sort of with some form of identity. And for many of them, you would have like an old fashioned called the midwife 
uniform or there was new uniforms. There's some in scrubs, there's some holding babies, there's some with stethoscopes. There's every variety of midwife representing all parts of the community um, represented in that display. And my goodness, they just looked wonderful. They, they really mm. did. I think, Jenny, you were sorry to be there, weren't you? Not, not to be, be there. there. Yeah. Not to be there, yeah. It was yeah. very difficult not to be there. But yeah, it, it, was, it was just wonderful to see how people had contributed. Mm. And there's also one or two male midwives. Got to remember that, yeah. that they were there too. There were yeah. a few there, weren't there? Mm. Yeah, I think there's a few on the front row that you yeah. can't see. And there's midwives there that you'll know as well. Um, yes. Yeah, if you look closely at one of the pictures, you will see some midwives you know. And of course, Jenny and I are in there holding the fort uh, somewhere. I think we're somewhere in the middle. <laughs> somewhere, yeah. yeah. But we, yeah. we also asked them, didn't we, to, to, to um, send in with the dolls themselves actually why they'd made it. Um, and we didn't get them for all of them, but the illustration there shows actually one of the the messages that was sent in particularly um straight to mr hunt mm. of why she was so why she'd made it so being so proud of her daughter who worked as a case loading midwife mm. and we had an, so many of those little messages didn't we that oh, were they, very poignant yeah i mean I, I can remember going into my manager at the time virtually sobbing at some of the stories because they were just so poignant there was you know stories from mothers from grandmothers from aunts mm. from women who'd had babies they were from sisters they were from midwives um you know they they came from everywhere the the furthest afield came from new zealand we had quite a lot come from germany um, we had some from Denmark, I think another one from Spain, and they all came with stories, you know, there were women who'd lost babies, it was just, you know, incredible, and when we get down to um, having a look at that data, Jenny, I think it's going to be really interesting in, mm -hmm. in seeing what, um, you know, looking at those stories again, and, yeah. and looking at the themes, Absolutely. but I think, yeah, one of the things is these, these midwives have personalities, and we gave them personalities as well. I mean, I think, I'm hoping it's the next slide. I mean, you know, there is a positive deviant. <laughs> you know, somehow, Leslie Page escaped and was sliding down the banister. And of course, we had to take a photo. Um, and there were, you know, there were lots of stories that came from midwives about, you know, the character of the midwife that they'd created. So I don't know if you want to talk about the, the next slide, Jenny, because this mm. is quite a powerful, yeah, powerful midwife. Yeah, I mean, this, this one actually had no mouth. Um, and what we signified from that really is, again, this midwife who, who has no voice. And some of the messages that actually came through from the questionnaire was that that midwives were feeling so frustrated because they they felt that they had no political voice mm. being able to speak out and to to say what was really going on in their in their practice mm. so seeing this one which didn't didn't have um didn't have a mouth was was quite significant to us and obviously this one was also crocheted rather than knitted and that was fine as well but mm. did, did you want to add anything more to that no, I mean, I think the main, one of the main themes that came from the survey was about this having a voice or not having a voice. And it was almost like the knitted midwives were speaking for them. And, you know, the, the knitted midwives were used as a medium for being able to express, like you say, the frustration um, and other thoughts they had about you know this this midwifery shortage but another thing that was interesting was there was a couple of comments on a couple of the questionnaires mm. that were completely the opposite it was about yeah. what are you doing you know this is childish this um you know what how can you do this it, it looks so unprofessional and I just wonder um where that came from and why that mm. was said. I mean, we've discussed this a lot, haven't we, Jenny? Yes. 
yeah yeah i mean i i think it it, it i mean the message felt very strongly that that they felt that we were we were putting midwifery back millions of years because actually we should be sort of stepping forward into research based kind of professional kind of world mm. um but actually this is research yeah. <laughs> it's a different different type of approach and and the responses to that display um pr produced an emotional response from people mm. and that that's again what we have found from the qualitative um responses to to the questionnaire itself Mm -hmm. that it actually stimulated something very powerful in people to see that number of, um, even though it was only 500 midwives mm -hmm. there, that the realisation, actually, this is this many that, that is missing from our profession mm -hmm. at the moment. And it was, it was a very powerful, powerful response that we got. Mm -hmm. So, Jenny... Does your creativity influence your teaching and activities with student midwives? Um, yes. <laughs> How? I think <laughs> <laughs> there you are. I answered that one. No, I. <laughs> it has because I, my understanding again, again of what I've just said that the emotive response that we got from people from even even just looking at. And, and participating within this activity shows that actually how art and um, using creative activities can unlock mm. professional conversations. It can unlock something a lot deeper than if you were just having a conversation just like you and me. I mean, we can go back in history and think of sewing bees. Now, you know, in the, in the, in the, um, and which are still taking place, but in the old days in America, where they created um, a quilt for somebody who was getting married in the local village. Then all the women would come together and sit round and make the quilt together. That the con it would trigger the conversations between them. And, mm -hmm. and this is the same with creative activities that we do in teaching and learning. And I have been using it in many different ways relating to spirituality, in understanding the art of midwifery practice, um, in in getting students to think about um, using using dramatic ways of doing, for example, I've I've um, taught or facilitated learning about the menstrual cycle by getting students to get out of their chairs and be part of that menstrual cycle, um, holding balloons. I can't see what I'm doing, but holding balloons as being the the ovum and, and things like that. And, and it, it kind of helps them to, to think about things in a different way. I mean, mm. some of them don't particularly like it. They think, oh, no, this isn't for me, but actually it does stimulate discussion, et cetera, afterwards. And then I've carried on to, to use it in research as well. So, um, and yourself, have you, have, what about you? Have you been using it within your teaching? I have. Um... I what I find is that students all have very different um, backgrounds and experiences and you know for some of them using creative means is a way of um, using skills they already have in I suppose an unknown environment and being able to express ideas and thoughts in a way um, that they maybe haven't thought of before. It's not always successful. When I first started out, um, we as a as a lecturer, um, I facilitated a session where students made a placenta, and it started off really well, and all the stuff was all over the place, a bit like you were describing, um, and then the fire alarm went off right in the middle, and we had to evacuate. And we were out of the classroom for probably, I don't know, half an hour, might have even been a bit longer. So when we came back, there was 20 minutes to make a placenta, clear up and clear the room. So it wasn't entirely successful, but um, it was a good learning experience about, you know, placentas. And there were some amazing uh, placentas produced. Um, but also I incorporate amateur dramatics as well um, mm. in some of my teaching as well, because I do, I do that as well um, as an aside. So there are so many different creativities that we can mm. use in the classroom that enables 
students to um you know deepen their learning and also that thought process and I'm just thinking about what you just said about um about textiles there's something about textiles that mm. you have to take your time and sometimes you've no idea what is going to come out of it at the end so it's almost like weaving those stories mm. you know you start off with one thing and that thought process carries on and then you end up with something completely different and you can mm. go back to it um you know like for example you know looking at at um you know this midwife with no mouth we've now identified that she was crocheted and I don't think we'd really thought about that before had we because mm. you know it was just a midwife with with no mouth mm. that's a, just a, a different way of doing it mm. isn't it yeah yeah different yeah, yeah. Mm. and and what about um oh I was just <laughs> I was just gonna say you you reminded me of, of um, when you're talking about your placenta story about when I used to, to do sessions on spirituality, I, I did use glitter sometimes and have, have glitter that was, was uh, part of it. And uh, one, one day um, I had, must have had a hole in my bag because I had to walk back to my office ca carrying these back, the, the, the creative things that had been left over, whatever. And I realized there was a whole trail of glitter that I had left down the corridor. And I was like, mm. Yes, anyway, I wasn't particularly popular after doing that, but there you are, these, these things happen. So, oh. But I think midwife lecturers particularly are, mm. are creative people. Mm. And when we moved into universities from way back when, before, um, you know, before we actually got degree programs, and moved into university. I think when, when midwives stepped into university, they felt they had to take on the university way of teaching. They had to, to start doing lectures. And this was even before the days of PowerPoint, everybody, we're that old. Mm. But, but actually, you know, they had, to, they had to learn new skills within a university setting to make it look as though we were a degree program. And, and so a lot of people stepped back from using creative methods at that time because they felt that it wasn't appropriate or they felt that the university wouldn't accept it. And then it seemed to have, have, have picked up again and it's very heartening to hear midwife lecturers out there who are mm -hmm. using creative methods a lot now. And I, I think it's, it's wonderful to hear that, that that's happening because it does help students to learn in a different way. Mm. So let's think about research as well. I'm running a little bit out of time here, I think, but anyway, let's get on to research and think about that. And, and I, I used creative methods in my, um, my doctoral work. It, it was um, education doctorate. Oh, you're going backwards. Oh, look. Yes. So see, I've put it in the right place. <laughs> you did put it in the right place. So that that is a quilt that I made as part of my doctoral study. I mean, there are other methods that I used within the um, within the study because it was in a bricolage. So anybody who wants to go and look that up about research methods and think about bricolage and what that means. It's like a patchwork. Aha. Here we go. Um, but I also, there, there are other methods that I use, such as photo elicitation. So if you want to go and look that one up as well. And I also made um, quilts for each of the, the participants, participants in the study, but they were quilts that were made with um, a PowerPoint as opposed to the quilt, the textile quilt, which is my reflective part of my study. So each one of those squares represents one entry into my research diary for the five years, uh, four to five mm. years that I was doing my study. So that's what that is. And, and it's pretty um, special to me because it is, it is my, my life over the past, not past, but during that time I was doing my education study. Mm. And there is actually a website where you can look it all up. So what about you from a research perspective where where are you going with yours what are you doing well, with craft I'm quite early in my doctoral research in that I'm just about to submit my proposal 
Um, so in view of the pandemic and other things, I know that I'm going to be using felting and I have produced two squares in preparation. But I think once my research gets underway, then um, I will be using that as a reflective process, probably in a similar way to how you mm. have, but I'll be using felting, which I suppose brings us on to another little idea you had when we met at a conference last oh, year. Oh dear, yes, that's and me. And you got me into trouble again. <laughs> I shall move the slides on while you explain. <laughs> well, yes, we had last year was meant to be the year of the nurse and the midwife. And I felt that we needed to have some kind of celebration of it in some way that was not, not just a celebration, but to inspire people to make um, a, a, a patchwork for themselves of nine different squares. Um, we decided we wanted to do it over a period of nine months because it seemed appropriate. And also actually, if you've got nine squares, then you can very easily have a cushion cover or have a hanger, um, a hanging patchwork that you can have at the end of it as a celebration of the year of the nurse and the midwife. And we started on this project in February last year. We launched it, I think in February last year. And then something called a pandemic appeared. And it, it kind of threw a bit of a spanner in the works. I, there, I know that there are some people out there who have participated and made their patchworks already. Um, and I, cause I have seen them and I have seen some amazing work that other people mm. have been doing for others and including ourselves, I think, mm. it has been more tricky to start mm. getting, to get going with it. I've made four squares now and you have made two. two. In fact, I've made five, but it's, it's not there yet. But it has been intensely a slow process. The idea was to do one each month as a reflection of that month in relation to midwifery practice. And I've had a, had, had a diary and I've drawn sketches for each of the months, but actually the making of it has become quite difficult. Mm. And it's, it's something to do with this pandemic has had an effect. Mm. Um, and now looking at the, those squares that we have there, the, the two, there are two there that actually are quite similar, aren't they? Mm. So do you want to just say what, what yes. happened there? Yeah, because we did these completely independently. Um, we didn't ever discuss any of the squares. They just sort of appeared on the blog and there they were. And I was just in the process of, of doing mine when yours appeared on the blog and I looked at it and I could not believe my eyes because it was mm. so similar to mine. And, and talking about, you know, the difficulty of producing them, I think the pandemic has brought up difficult stuff mm. and for me I mean you you can have a look at the blog and read it I won't um, go into it in great detail but the the one that I did you know represents my daughter I mean it could represent anybody which is why it doesn't have a face because you know you put your own person this is this is the one down on the bottom right hand corner on the screen yeah, isn't it That's this one. one yeah whether I don't know if you could see my arrow, but it's, it's that one. And by the time I'd finished it, I was absolutely wrung out just with the, mm. um, because, you know, as I was saying before about weaving a story, every stitch in that meant something. And my daughter is an army nurse. And I suppose, you know, when you think army, you think, um, you know, people going into battle. And, you know, you think that's what parents worry about. But I've never worried about Katie being a nurse because, um, you know, she's she's likely to be looking after people who are unwell in critical care, not actually in the middle of a battle. But then doing that, I suddenly realised, well, there's a virus. It could be that virus mm. that. And it was difficult stuff to process, very difficult. Mm. And I think that's why, I, found, I mean, I've got the ideas for the other ones. Um, they're there in my head and I will do them. But 
um, it, it's been hard and I think it's been hard for everybody. And I think the thing about crafting and creativity is that emotional connection. Because mm. while you're doing the work, <clears throat> you're processing those difficult emotions or, you know, there might not be difficult emotions, but you are still going through that process and it, it can be tricky. And I think we talked about that, didn't we, um, yeah. Jenny? Mm. Yeah, because I actually, the, you know, over this pandemic, people have experienced difficulties with mm. with their mental well-being. And I'm, I'm mm. very conscious of, of midwives in, out there who've been holding Mm. holding this space holding this inside mm. and I think there will be more need for people to respond to this in a um to the pandemic mm. and to get some help to respond to it um and maybe art therapy or may, maybe creative therapy will be a positive thing for some people and may, maybe mm. not mm. um so I I think I think it's it's been a tricky time but there is still time for you to get involved if you feel that you'd like to make your own um, patchwork to celebrate being a midwife over this time, then please come and join us and, and do, do make, make something. And you can read everything about it on the, um, the WordPress that, that we have made. Um, and we've been writing our own blogs, which sort of it reflects on why we've made things. Mm. Because it's not just, I've made this, it is about actually why. Why is it that, it, that we chose these colors? Why, why is it that did we choose these particular images to think of? And of course the black one that is the bottom left-hand corner was, was the month actually when um, George Floyd died. Um, shocking, absolutely shocking. And which is why I've got the Black Lives Matter um, mm. hashtag there, but, but at the same time about the issues around maternal deaths for women who are black and Asian. Um, and, and that's why I've got the, the five times more hashtag there for that particular situation, because that month it happened all at the same time and it was just raw, felt very raw. And I couldn't do much more than, but just present it like that. So, so that's why that's there. So if you do want to get involved, please, please come and join us and, and have a look at the website and ask mm -hmm. us any questions. And maybe by the ICM we, in June, we will have something that is complete that we might be able to share as part of it. So. Better crack on yeah. then. Better crack on. <laughs> I think... Don't think yeah, where are we? April. Hmm. Could be, be, could right. be tricky. <laughs> be right. <laughs> I think also this as, next year. <laughs> as well, Jenny, is that the thing about crafting and creativity, there's no right and there's no wrong. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can a stitch can cover a multitude of sins, I have discovered. Um, yeah. when you're making things particularly when you're felting because I make all sorts of errors and I just cover it up with another color who's to know and it's about your interpretation and about how you feel about it and your connection with that piece of work so there is no right there is no wrong fabulous fabulous now <laughs> I think I think the the speed at which um, people have to get going on thinking about the quilt. I mean, some people will have been working on this um, since it was um, mentioned last year. So I guess this is quite a good call to arms for those of you who maybe thought it had vanished. Um, and so do go to this. this Hello, come back again. Yes, this word pros, uh, press. Uh, section and and see what's there and I think I think that point about perf sort of whether something's right was was really important because I think sometimes we get a bit hung up on having the perfect thing you know and I know you know when you're you're making something you you have a picture in your mind about how it's going to look and if it doesn't kind of come out quite as you expected it can be quite disappointing because you kind of think well it's got to look very pretty and I just need to share with the audience this is my patchwork not for 
for this <laughs> year of the nurse and midwife. I started this many, many years ago when I was a student. And it's even got cards that I took from, you know, to, to put that are still in there that from that time. And it's still not finished. I have to add it together. And in actual fact, this this evening's given me the kind of impetus to think, actually, yeah. I, ought to go and, I ought to finish it. And what I could do is I could put some crafty things on here about this last year. That's what I'm going to do. There I'm, you go. I've got there you go. <laughs> now, I've got not many, not a huge amount of questions, but people are, are there thinking about it. And Suzanne Crozier now, this is a good one. Do you think midwifery is a craft? Uses craft knowledge. Needlework requires planning and organisation. I wonder if you mean needlework with the maybe stitching work there. Um, requires planning and organisation and patience and dexterity also needed by midwives. Mm. I think, it. well, it's, it's coming back to this fact that midwifery is an art and a science. It's mm. both. And, craft. and or and it... craft. Well, yes, it is. It is a craft. I mean, we we've got these these images of midwives sitting in the corner knitting, haven't we? From from years ago, and I do know independent midwives who would sit in the corner and knit, and and you know they'd make a baby hat while their baby was being born, and 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 it. There was a discussion a while ago, I think, about the fact that the NMC might not be very happy about this process about because you're not concentrating. But in fact, actually, the process of knitting helps you to concentrate more mm. because you are you are focusing your brain on something that, as long as it's not too mm. complicated, that you are bro <laughs> you are focusing on something that is is uh, is quite sort of calming, mm. and so therefore you can concentrate more of what of what's going on ahead of you. But yes, I think I think I understand what Suzanne is saying about mm. about the fact with suturing. But but you know we didn't start suturing until the late eighties, nineties, I think, sort of time. Yeah. So so before that time, they weren't suturing in 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 that way. But but yes, that that you do need to have that dexterity. Perhaps that's the word, mm. in order to 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 have practice what about you Lindsay Do you want to yeah add I that? think it's also about using all your senses as well you mm -hmm. use all your senses in crafting you use all your senses um in midwifery and you know when you're saying about knitting quietly in a corner it's about that watchful attendance isn't it mm -hmm. um and also I would suggest you knit a dishcloth they're very easy um <laughs> you didn't don't need a lot of concentration <laughs> for those if you're a tobacco <laughs> Or you could knit a uterus. Or you yeah. could knit a uterus or yeah. a breast. Or a I don't breast. know where or mine are, actually. Yeah. No, I don't know where yeah. mine are. I should have brought that out. I think mine are in class, yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. I found it interesting what you were saying, Jenny, about education, because I, I know that it's we've got a long history. I mean, mm -hmm. I think in midwifery education and nursing education, to a certain extent, we were taught how to teach in education, which not all people in universities were one thing I need to say mm. but also I can remember we never had very much equipment did no. we so no. we had to make stuff and one of the mm. things and, and I can remember you this you used for parent craft sessions mm. you know so you could put your baby in here and out it came from the uterus and when I went to Macedonian to teach some midwives how to teach mm. and to, to develop a curriculum one of the first things we did was all knit uteruses and the classroom we had full of little knitted uteruses, which was made people smile, but mm. actually made people talk and think about how they would teach. Mm. So it was really, a, when I think back, it was a very good exercise. To yeah. do. It also and makes it, you think about your body as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we have some, we have some, uh, comments there was one comment from maria maria mariana rosa hi mariana from she's from argentina wow welcome she knitted one of those midwives one of your midwives, wow. Oh, wow. and donated it via jackie gerard how oh. Oh, right i bet we've got a picture of it somewhere it's I probably on think, the i should, I should yeah. think she was looking at that photo looking for her midwife oh and fantastic she, uh, she says, I'm happy to see this bunch of beautiful different midwives there. 
So the picture will be on the website, but I'm sure. Mm. I think it yeah. is, because I think I've got a picture of Jackie Gerrard <laughs> holding a midwife. Ah. I think there might be one on the on the website. There you are, Marianne. Mm. Go yeah. to the website and have yeah. a look. Fantastic. How fabulous. Yay. And we've got more comments. We've got Donna Clement saying, I love these patches and strongly believe that creative therapies are underused and underappreciated. Mm. Mm. Comments yeah. more questions. And Jilly Ireland. Hi, Jilly says i'm so happy to have been alongside this midwifery history to show my age no 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 none of that <laughs> in the words of welsh comedian max boyce i was there i thought the knitted midwives idea was inspired and also jilly i know jilly has done her 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 patchwork oh um, fabulous the midwife oh, patchwork. excellent she, she's got done hers and has has made it into a hanging i think Is oh that, wow I think that's right Wow, we'll, have, yes. to, we'll so have to hear more about um, that. She mm. said she took a midwife knitted by a woman from our community antenatal craft and music group. Great. So we, we know that you've been up mm. to other things, Jilly. And mm. then Suzanne's replied. She said, I didn't mean suturing. I meant knitting, etc. Sorry, Suzanne. Uh, but thank you for answering. So interesting. We used to knit on night duty in the 80s. It was mm. we were talking about that. Yeah. yeah. We were saying, do you remember the times when you used to be able to knit on a night shift? Oh, yeah. yeah. Not exactly. anymore. Not now. <laughs> Too busy. Not anymore. Mm. But I can remember people being very um, disapproving when you went to a refresher course or a, a course of some sort. And somebody in, would be in the back room, knit, back row knitting. And some people are very disapproving of that. Mm. So, yeah, the there, there, are, there are mixed mixed feelings mm. about it, and, and I do understand that because yeah. because I think I think for some some people, craft crafting gives an image perhaps of of not I don't know not being professional, and yeah. I think both of us would strongly disagree with that. Um, I think I think you've illustrated that beautifully, actually. <laughs> Fantastic. I could I could listen to you for another hour, but our hour is now up. Wow. <laughs> and it's flown by. It has. I, I really so hope that people have been inspired to take this up if you haven't and share with colleagues, because I, I have to say, I think it, it might help over the coming mm. months and years, because mm. I think both Jenny and Lindsay did identify that, that you know the COVID effect is going to be with us for a while and we need yeah. to make sure we support each other and support ourselves so mm. thank you so much Jenny and thank you so much Lindsay for coming this evening we'll have thank to you. have you again thank to show you. the finished <laughs> article when it's finished in thank June? you is that June oh gosh I'm gonna have to go with it then <laughs> I'll wait well, till Jenny tells me. <laughs> okay, I'll book you for July then. <laughs> thank you, Sue. So thank, thank you. you so much to our lovely speakers. Now, some of us will be on the social media. So if you want to make any comments, we might be able to, to respond to you. And resources will be available on the Facebook Live um, website and on Facebook on Friday and you'll be able to watch this again and again and share it with your colleagues because people will be really interested in this. Now, next week, we have Sheena Byram, who, who's our guest chair, and she'll be showing the practicing midwife have just done two, I think it's two new e-learning modules entitled Safer Together, an introduction to culture, race and bias in midwifery practice, which is really current and really important the speakers who've been involved in the creation are our lovely alicia burnett sheridan thomas and georgia allen and and the latter two are the my midwives uk you, people will know uh, georgia and sheridan so i want to say a big thank you to our lovely speakers and a big thank you to our lovely audience thank you for participating i look forward to seeing lots and i'll do it myself Lots and lots of, of patchworks being involved. And in the meantime, take care and see you soon. Thank you. One of the benefits, Thank I think, of, of a platform like this is that if you are busy clinically or if you can't watch or listen or engage um, real time, 
you can do this at other times. So that is fabulous for such a time as this. So delighted to be with you all, albeit virtually um, on the screen. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Dunkley bent I'm the Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England. And good morning to everyone. Welcome indeed to this Scottish Midwifery Online Festival. And good morning and welcome to the Maternity and Midwifery London online festival. Good morning and welcome to the second annual Maternity and Midwifery Festival. What 2020 has shown us is that there's a real need for vigilance, that women's rights are not yet really embedded um, in our maternity system and that they can be easily eroded. My argument is that the solution is health optimization. Prevention is far better than cure. And I think there is a real risk that services that are lost or reduced during the time of COVID are not restored. The hard truth is there is a lot of racism there. It's not enough to be non-racist swimming in a pool of racism. You have to be anti-racist, actively working against racism. And I say that because when we treat the least, well, everybody benefits. And if I had a take home message, looking at my career and where I've been in my career, my take home message would be, grab it every opportunity you can, it's not a rehearsal. Know your limitations because jam too thinly spread is tasteless. Enjoy all and let nobody, nobody steal your sparkle. And I hope that you can take valuable insights from today. And if you're listening tonight or if you're listening next week or next month, take valuable insights from the speakers from today and share the word, share the positive messages with your colleagues. Because in these dark times, in these challenging times, everybody needs a green shoot and a pearl of wisdom. Thank you very much. And um, we are in this together. We stand united together. <laughs>